After family, my day job, and the passion project that is this YouTube channel, the next thing that I spend the most time on is TTRPGs, or tabletop role-playing games. In 2022, I played 134 games, 30 of which I was the GM or Games Master for, so that's a big enough hobby to warrant some automation. I thought I'd show you my Obsidian setup for TTRPGs in 2023. If you're on my Patreon, first of all, thank you. But secondly, this vault that I'm going to be demonstrating to you is already available for you to download at the link in the description below. I'm going to talk about things that I do outside of the game and then things that I do during the game, whether I'm a GM or a player. This is that Patreon TTRPG vault. And let's talk about how we would create a world in the beginning. So you can see I already have a sample world here and a TTRPG's games index. There's a nice little banner here that you can kind of move around. This is a mid-journey generated image actually. Just kind of sets the scene because a lot of my RPGs are fantasy based. Okay, so I've got all my worlds here. Right now there's only one. So I'm going to click on this button and create a new world. This was using a combination of the buttons plugin, quick add and templater. I'm going to add a new world and I'm going to call it Obsidia. And you'll see that Obsidia was created as a world here in the files on the left side here. And a folder was created for it with a world page within that. This is that world page. The world is called Obsidia. And let's say that this system is Pathfinder 2E. I would then put my player characters here or I can create my new session by clicking here and I'm just following the instructions here and I'll open up the command palette with the command control P and then I'll look at quick add and then there are two session ones. There's add session GM and add session player. So I'm going to do the add session player one and just hit enter and that's created another one. So this is getting a little cluttered. So let's remove some of these things. Maybe we don't need the games index since we just have the one world exit out of that. Now we have the world on one side, which as you can see has already been updated with the session. So I have this data view query, or I can, you can also just use a list here. There are some truths about this campaign or world. I mean, I just jumped right into the first session, but you can also fill out this part if you are a GM, and you'll also have a list of factions here once we have those, there's also a section for custom rules. I mean, these are just new pages, so you'd have to click into them to create them. And house rules and safety tools. So back to the first session, you'll see that it already filled out the template. Now, this is something that I determined beforehand. If I open up that template, this is what it looks like because I'm using Templator. And all of those strings get automatically populated. So now it's saying if I am using Fantasy Calendar, for example, it's also going to be using the name of the world. And then scrolling down here, this is where I can put the session summary after the session. There's no games found right now because this is the first one. And I would click here and start typing out stuff in the log. So let's say went to Absalom and met Rome. Let's say that. So right now these two things are still kind of faded and that's because they're not real places or people yet. So Absalom is a place. I'm going to hold down command and click on it so that it opens up in the new tab here. And you'll see that another template was filled in for it. So it's still tagging it with the same campaign, but now I can say that Absalom is a place. I can put a description here, the biggest city close to Atari, for example. So I can say Absalom is where we met Grom. So now let's go ahead and create Grom. I'm just gonna click on it this time so it opened it up in the same tab. This time I'm going to say that Grom is an NPC and we know that Grom lives in Absalom. So I'm gonna say that Grom is a elven man who looks dodgy. Okay, we can also talk about Grom's affiliation. So we say Grom is part of, so let's just create a faction here and say Angulan Knights. 
Now, Angular Knights would be a faction, so let's go ahead and create that as a faction. We'll say that they are an Absalom, and you'll see that in the world page, they came up here in the faction section because this is a date of you query specifically for factions within this folder. And I can say group of vengeful knights seeking to overthrow Absalom leaders. And we'll put led by Grom. So what I'm showing you here is how you can interconnect all of these things. If we open up Absalom again, so then I'll hit the command semicolon. This is a, a particular shortcut for me. And I'll say NPCs in place. Let's say I want a list of all of the NPCs in Absalom. Now this still has the templator syntax. To change that and apply all the templates, I'm going to hit my hotkey for it, which is command option R. Now this is going to be different for you because I set it to something else. To see what it is, you can just go to the command palette and you can search for replace templates and then you can hit enter here. You can set a hotkey for this if you want in settings and then hotkeys. But I've already replaced that and you can see here that Obsidia is already filled in as the world. So now we'll see that both Angular Knights and Grom are listed because this is looking for an NPC or a faction. Now if we didn't want a faction, we could just remove this part and now it'll just show NPCs and the location, Absalom. So then we can put NPCs in place. And now we've got a nice little connected network here. We didn't have to fill in any of these things really because we're using templates to do it. Let's go back to this log here for the session. And let's say we did some more things and, and maybe we entered a dungeon. So this kind of depends on whether or not your GM already has a map. If they don't give you a map, you can use Excalidra. So I'm gonna show you that by going to the command palette. I'd select create new drawing in a pop-out window and embed into the active document. That's usually what I do. Now, this is in light mode. Of course, you can change that if you would prefer. I'm just going to stick to it for now. While the DM is going through the layout of the dungeon, I might do that as well. So I might have, you know, a square room here. And then, you know, maybe let's make this not curved. So just like a square there. And you can double click within it to type out something. So you can say foyer. And you can move that around or you can make that bigger and you can draw lines here. And once you remember what the keyboard shortcuts are, you can also use those numbers that you see shown here. So for example, six draws a line already and two draws a rectangle or a square. So then you can do things like that. And then that way you build up this map so that you don't have to rely on your GM telling you where you went and so you don't get lost. And then I would then click on save as PNG into the vault. And then when I close this one, so sometimes it looks like it's not there, but it actually is. You just have to kind of refresh it by opening the same page again or by switching to reading view. So there it is. Now you can jump right back into this Excalibur draw drawing by clicking on this if you explore more parts of it. So what if you do get a map though? Or what if you are the GM? So we're getting into a bit of the GM section. Let's close this and generate another one, but as a GM. To do that, I'm going to stop using this world just because this world was one that we were a player in. So I'm going to go to new world actually, open up the world page here, and then do the session again using the template, but this time I'm going to select session GM. And that opens up this one, which is the skin session, and you'll see that it's a little bit different. So now there are sections that are specifically for the GM. First, there's housekeeping, which is where I would say, hey, I can't make it at this time next week. You know, is everybody cool if we start an hour later, or an hour earlier or something? And then I'd have a recap, which automatically pulls in the summary from the previous one. So here we have the first one. Um, I'm just going to type something here just so we know. Okay, and 
this is ideally something that I would fill out after the game and before the next one. And so then in the second session, I can read out the recap a little bit so that my players remember where they were and what they were doing. And then I would start with something strong, like some big incident, sometimes combat, but just reminds me to think about making that starting thing an interesting hook. Then I have some scenes, which is like different places and circumstances that I want to have happen during the game. And then secrets and clues. Now this might look really familiar to you if you've watched another YouTuber that I greatly admire named Sly Flourish. He has a very similar setup here. The only things that I don't put here are NPCs, monsters, and locations because those are pretty easy anyway to sneak into scenes, I feel. And I have 10 secrets and clues here. I would take them off as I tell them to my players. Then I have some loot here if I have anything in mind. Finally, there's anything else that's in the log. Now let's say that I want them to go into uh, the Vault of Bones. What is the Vault of Bones? Well, let's open this up and make this a place now. So I have Finder open here with the Vault of Bones map. And this is something that I just made in an app called Dungeon Scroll. So I'm just going to drag it from my Finder window into here. And look, it's already imported this image into the vault. Now, as a GM, I would probably want to prep some of these things. So I might say that this is a map. And then after it, I'll put the actual locations. Well, let's say foyer or entrance. And then what I typically do, because I can leave it at this, but usually what I like to do is I like to use Leaflet. Obsidian Leaflet is another community plugin made by Jeremy Valentine. You'll hear that name again. And I already have a shortcut for it, but you can also just copy this one. This is just like a, a template, so I don't have to type the whole thing every time. And I'll put Vault of Bones, and I'll also put Vault of Bones here without the PNG. And what that does is it transforms this map into something that I can firstly zoom in and out of, and I can also annotate this. So let's go into settings here, scroll down to Obsidian Leaflet, and then at the bottom, there's a default map marker. So we can add additional map markers. I'm going to add another one. This one is going to be Thumbtack. And this is a font awesome icon. You can go over to that site to find, I don't know, hundreds of icons, but there are already a few here. So I'm going to select the Thumbtack icon and I'll say I don't want it to be overlaid. So it's just gonna be an actual thumbtack. And then I can change the marker color too. So let's say we want this to be blue. And I'm going to click save. So that way, in addition to the default one, we can also use the thumbtack. Okay, so now when we get back to this map, I can right click on it and click on thumbtack. And there's a thumbtack that I can actually move around anywhere on the map, but I'm going to click on it, edit marker, and select the Vault of Bones page that we're already on, but then add a hash at the end of it and then select foyer. And then I'll exit out of that. And this time when I hover over it, it'll say, hey, this is the Vault of Bones foyer. And when I click on it, it goes right back to foyer. So what I also like to do is I can link to this page and link to the map section, go back and then add an alias to this link sort of. So I'll say back to map, just so when there are a lot of locations, I can always click on it and hey, I'm back at the map. So you can imagine that this would be really cool to have you know, different thumbtacks or different markers in places. And just by hovering over them, I can see what that place is and quickly jump to that location to see what I should tell the players. So this is something that I would do outside of the game. This is how I do my prep work. So something that my players might find in the foyer are some monsters. And depending on the system, I have some stat blocks for that. So I'm going to insert some templates here because I already have templates of a few stat blocks. I can hit command semicolon and then type stats and I can choose which one it is. So in this case, I'm going to say OSR. 
So I've just quickly typed up a stat block for it. I'm gonna hit enter so you can see what it looks like. This is what the stat block looks like and this is specific to OSR. This is using a plugin called TTRPG Stat Blocks by Jeremy Valentine, who also made Obsidian Leaflet. These started just for 5e, but then he started to allow other people to create their own templates. So I've gone and made my own. So here are some stat block examples. So here's a full example for a 5e monster and also a blank template, which is what is in the stats 5e template. So this is what that looks like and you could fill out what you need to and delete what you don't. There's also a fate core one, which actually does come with the plugin and it has aspects and temporary aspects and consequences as well. And then instead of HP, you've got physical and mental stress. So it's very dependent on the system. Now I created this generic OSR one and also the, the template for it. And then here's one for Nave 2E in particular. This is one character that was in one of my games. The stat blocks aren't just for monsters. In this one, a Cypher Numenera one that I created, this is actually the PC stat block. So this is actually my character that I'm playing through right now and her actual abilities and starting stats. So I can also have Cyphers in here and these things can be actual link. So that's why they're kind of purple, like obsidian purple. So by hovering over it, I can see the note. So while I'm playing the game, I can also quickly see what things I have to use and still works the same way in that you can go down into it and change anything that's here. There's also a template for that. I want to definitely create more of these templates for TTRPG stat blocks. And when I do find them or create them myself, I'm going to put them here. So over here, I have a systems folder where I have four different systems, Black Hack, Iron Sworn, Merc Bore, and Pathfinder 2E. So for Pathfinder, I only have the condition so far. I do want to eventually move everything in the SRD over, but I started with the conditions because it is just so handy to be able to see all of the conditions and to hover over them. And look, I know exactly what observed means. So that's very handy. So I use this as a reference while I'm playing the game or sometimes even before the game to remember what certain things mean. But for some of these, like with Black Hack, these are just available for free online anyway. So I just link to it here and then the entire rule book is already here. Now I also use Obsidian as my DM's brain addict. This is a phrase that was coined by Sly Flourish. And what it means is a collection of things that inspire you. The awesome thing about Obsidian is there are plugins for it that are specifically for TTRPGs as you've already seen. One thing that I haven't shown you yet is Dice Roller, also made by Jeremy Valentine, who made a few of the other plugins that we talked about. I'll show you what that looks like by opening up a workspace. So that was my keyboard shortcut for managing workspace layouts. And I'll click on load in during the game. And what that does is it opens up a special configuration of things that I like to see when I'm running the game. Now this is a little bit condensed right now, Normally when I'm actually running a game, I would have it spread out over multiple monitors, but this is just kind of to show you what you could build. Now I have a few things here and they're all built on random tables. So over here I have items, for example, this is giving me occult treasures and you'll see that there's an icon of two dice here, two D sixes, and I can just roll it and get different things every time. Now you might wonder where that's coming from. Well, this is currently in reading view. So I'm going to switch to source view just so I can show you what that looks like. And it is coming from the note loot. So let's open that loot note. And you can see that it was actually from the Merc Bory of rules. I'm going to open that in a new tab and just to see it a little bit better, I'm gonna say move to the new window just so I can show you what that looks like. This note actually contains a few tables and they show different things. Like this first one is occult treasures. And over here, I specify how many dice I want to roll. Now, 1d66 would be hard to roll normally, but Mark Bory is a little bit different, right? So this is just a markdown table. And I entered the dice roll result, the name and the description. 
And then I tag it with a name, which I called treasure. So what that does is now I can go in here and just type out the syntax. So let me try that now. So I'm just doing the back ticks, dice, and then I'm opening up this page. So that's loot. And then I type the carrot, and then I type whatever the name was for that table. And that was treasure. So then I'm going to hit enter and then there it is. This is exactly what I was seeing in my workspace. So that's how all of these tables were built. These are random item tables. So let's see what else I've got here. I also have non-magical trinkets in case you want to give your players something, but you don't want them to necessarily be magical items. I can say you got a tangled ball of human hair. Sure. And of course that's from Merc Boy. Now, the cool thing is that some of these are from Merc Boy, but some of them are from Ironsworn. You can actually create your own too. They don't have to be from something else. I just didn't want to create them for you. But you can also do the same thing with NPCs. So when I switch this to reading view, I'll say if I have to improvise an NPC, I can say, yeah, they're a farmer and they're looking for their long lost brother. And they're a little bit selfish because they keep the best game for themselves. And I can go into settings as well. I have some locations uh, like woods or swamp, and you can use that on the fly or you can use it to build adventures beforehand, different types of regions. There's settlements as well, settlement name like Bleakmoor, or you can use a name that's a word in an old world language like Damula. There's also weather grave-like hold. Again, you can change all of these. There's names of dungeons, a trap, just ideas for traps, what residents are in the dungeon, what makes the dungeon distinctive, you know, inscriptions on the rooms and maybe one of them has bloodied beds and that kind of thing. Each of these are still just tables. This is an iron sworn one. And so I've created a lot of these random tables that you can use or you can create your own because those random tables are just markdown tables. So you can think of your own ideas beforehand and create your own random tables to inspire yourself during games. Here's another one for plot. This talks about an inciting incident. This could be a good potential strong start, like maybe a sacrifice or someone that was supposed to be a sacrifice escaped a death cult and stumbles into the path of the players. You know, maybe there's an event. It's called Fool's Fall. What is that? Why is it historical? I don't know. That's something to go with. Combat is the same. There's arcane catastrophes and mystic backlashes, uh, traps and devilry as well. And there's also monsters. Now this is a little bit different in that this is not random. This is a data view query. So this is an example of a data view query that returns all the creatures with a type undead with a CR between seven and 10. This is what the data view query looks like and I'm leaving it here so that you can copy it and change it and see if you can also create something like it. And this is what it returns, but I can really change that as well. So maybe let's say humanoid instead of undead. And that brings up a bunch of other places. So there's the source here. Now, because of copyright restrictions, I don't put the actual monster stats in here, but I did use another tool that I wrote, which is called CO's Guide to Monsters, because CO was my first character in D&D ever. And I have all of the monsters here for 5e, not necessarily Watsy, but I have a lot of like artisanal monsters here, third party monsters. And what I have for them are just the basic stats. So let's take a look at this Aboleth. This is Advanced 5e by Nworld. So there's a source here. This is the Monstrous Menagerie book and it's page 16. And I just have some stats for it, like it's HP and stuff. Now this isn't intended to be a way to get stats or information if you don't have the book. This is intended for use by people who already have the books. But even without the stats here, you can already go and find the right book or maybe buy that book if you're specifically looking for something that is a little bit difficult to find. Like what if it's a plant? 
And see, you've got heaps of things from Tome of Beasts. Those books are awesome, by the way. What about combat? If you're also moving away from D&D Beyond like I am, you may be looking for a solution, but I actually was already not using the Encounter Builder in D&D Beyond. So I'll exit out of these and go back to that session that we created, which was in New World. This is the GM one. So let's just say it's in the middle of the game and you spring a surprise on your characters and you want to add a combat and throw it into the mix. So let's just go through the process of creating an NPC. Actually, just to try it out, let's get a name from here. Her name is Ifella. Okay, Ifella. And I'm gonna click on that. And I'm gonna make her a PC actually. And let's say she's in Absalom. And because she's a PC, I'm going to also insert a template that I already have for PCs. And that has HPAC modifier level. So let's say she only has 19 and her AC is 16. She has a plus two in initiative. And let's say she's level one. Okay, a level two. Ithala is a gnome barbarian, let's just say. Now we can go into settings here for initiative tracker and add a new player. So we will say that Ithala is a player. So you'll see that it pulled in all of the stats from the front matter. I'm gonna hit okay and she shows up right there. And I could add a party, but since it's just her, I'm just gonna add her separately. And I can change what her name is here, so I'll just keep it as Ithella. So I'll say that's the name of the PC, and I'll spread it out a little bit here, and I'll add a few other monsters. So we go into the TTRPG stat blocks example. You know, I had an ancient black dragon. I'm just gonna save this to the bestiary. Oh, it looks like it was already saved, but I overwrote it anyway. So I'll open up the initiative tracker here and with Ithella, we're going to add an ancient black dragon. And some of these things are already filled in from the 5e SRD, if that's what you want to run. And I can click here to roll the initiative based on the score. And I'll click save. Now our Ithella is going to be facing an ancient black dragon, which it's correctly identifying to be a deadly encounter. Now I know I may be mixing things up here. I use a lot of systems, but I just want to show you different conditions that I've done. These don't come with the TTRPG initiative tracker. This is the name of this plugin, also made by Jeremy Valentine. And during combat, I really like to use them because I can assign conditions. So let's say we start combat and we hit play. It is now round one. And on the side here, there is a log folder and this is set in initiative tracker settings, but I already did that here. So now I can open up this page and this is actually the log for this entire battle. And it's telling me it's Ithela's turn. Okay, Ithela's here. Ideally, I would fill this out, this stat block for her. But let's just say she manages to do four damage to the ancient dragon. The HP is deducted. It says how much damage the dragon took. And let's say that also applies some conditions. I'm going to go through a bunch of different um, conditions here. So for example, maybe the dragon is now flat footed. That's from Pathfinder. And I'll put that on there. And it also says that in the combat log. So I can actually take this and put this into the session note so that later on I'm going to have a log of everything that I'm doing, especially when I'm the GM. I don't necessarily want to be like narrating what happens on each turn, but I still kind of want to know what happened. And this is a really great way of doing that. So let's go through a few more here. Maybe it's the dragon's turn next and now let's just say he does one damage to Ithella and poor Ithella is going to get a condition applied to her, but let's just scroll through the list as well. So I've already put in all of the Pathfinder conditions and the cool thing is if it's deafened, for example, so poor Ithella is deafened. I've also put in the description. So it says you can't hear, you automatically critically fail perception checks, blah, blah, blah. This is also, 
a great way of having to not look up the conditions and it is super handy. So if you're playing the one ring, for example, you can also use these conditions. So I have some of the stances. So there's open, forward, defensive, rearward, but I also have some other conditions like miserable, weary, and wounded. So let's say she takes up a defensive position. What does that mean? Well, it can hover over that. Attacks versus you are minus 1D attacks, and your attacks are minus 1D. So basically, you're giving up being able to attack as efficiently as you would, but then everybody else is also not attacking you efficiently as well. And you can protect other companions too. So I'm mixing up the statuses here, but this is a cool way of being able to see who got what condition when that is really important in Pathfinder. This is essential for me for running any sort of game. And also when I click on the Ancient Black Dragon, because we had that stat block here, we can also see everything that the dragon does, all of the abilities. And if you're a DM that likes to play in person, for example, I know a lot of people use this open player view, and this is the screen that they share with their players. Or you can actually share this on Zoom or something too, like share this window so that people know like, are the bosses hurt? Well, this is a really nice touch too, because it doesn't say the HP and AC of the creatures, only of the players, but the statuses are there because that's things that people would know anyway, the initiative and in general, how are they doing? If you listen to all of that and you're thinking it's really complex, remember that Obsidian is as complex as you make it. There's nothing wrong with going back to the basics and just having a note that's a chronological log of a session, and then maybe having another note that is for the campaign, where you link to all of your session notes. Maybe that's as far as you want to take it and that's totally fine. But if you're trying to build up this bigger monster NPC item database with initiative trackers and like leaflet maps and all that, then I hope I've given you some inspiration and some excitement for what Obsidian can do for TTRPG GMs and for TTRPG players. If you'd like to get a sample of all of this, then Patreons already get it. The link is in the description below. You'll also get everything that was in the vault, so the data and the settings are going to be in there as well. If you'd like to see my own personal TTRPG vault, which unfortunately I can't share in its entirety because of copyright reasons, then I do show part of it in this video. This is my DM's Brain Attic, also in Obsidian. Thank you for watching. May all your rolls be nat 20s. And if you do get nat ones, may they be even more fun. Cheers.